Hello, and welcome to my TED Talk. I'm gonna break this up into three parts and talk about each season individually. I'm Mother Goose, by the way, and this is my official pitch for the next Avatar series. So, one thing I really need to clarify is that this idea, it isn't wholly mine. When The Legend of Korra came out, this idea was going around the internet a lot, and I can't remember if it was Tumblr or Reddit, but it was one of those sites. Maybe both. But the basic idea is that the next Avatar is actually Earthbending Twins. And when this idea first came out, a lot of people really wanted it to be like, well, one of the twins gets two of the elements and the other twin gets the other two. I disagree with this because of how we know Rava works. Now, I'm pretty sure that this theory came out right after Legend of Course Season 1 came out. So at this point, people didn't know about Rava. But like I said, I don't think Rava would split her spirit in two. Because that's just really confusing. Because like, what if one twin died? Would Rava's spirit just die there? Would it... Would that half of her spirit be reborn? I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't know why I'm talking about this so much. Also, sorry about my mic. My professional mic is dead. It's gone. Bye-bye. So I'm using this mic until my replacement comes in. I also posted this on TikTok a couple days ago, but it was like a really short, 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 short explanation. And a lot of people were like, oh, well, what if one of the twins is, has a spirit of Vatu and... While I really like that idea and would love to see that someday, we've got to remember that Vatu and Rava fight every 10,000 years. So, while I do believe that's a possibility for the future, it's going to be a while. And Brian and Mike, I'm telling you, I think, at least speaking for myself, I would love to see a sci-fi Avatar series set thousands of years in the future about Rava and Vatu's next fight. I think that would be really awesome, but I don't think that would work for this series, because this is the Avatar right after Korra. So, Korra dies. First and foremost, I just want to say I've always had a feeling that Korra would die younger. And then I kind of started looking at the math, and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, this makes sense that she would die around this age. And that age is 30, just nine years after the series ends. How she dies, I don't know, but she does. And that makes me really sad. I, I actually really liked Korra. And I enjoyed The Legend of Korra. Don't get me wrong, there's things I really don't like about it. But overall, I enjoy the series. I think it's a good series. It's just not as good as Avatar The Last Airbender. But no show is. So, you know. What's it gonna do, right? Aang dies at the age of 66. That is 54 years after Sozin's Comet. If Korra died at the age of 30, that would mean it's been 84 years since the last Sozin's Comet which would line up perfectly with the next Avatar learning that they're the Avatar at the age of 16. So I really want Sozin's Comet to play a big part in Season 1. I don't want it to be like a big season finale, because then we'd just be copying Avatar The Last Airbender, but it's right, it's in the right time frame for the next Sozin's Comet. Hi, okay, future Mother Goose here. I kind of forgot to say something. And yes, I am recording off my phone. I'm very sorry about that. One big theme for this season of course, I'm talking about it now, is Sozin's Comet, but I want there to be a lot of tension from the other nations, from non-firebenders, because the Fire Nation has used Sozin's Comet to commit horrible crimes the last two times it's come about. So, while the Fire Nation isn't planning anything sneaky this time, they just want to live in peace, you know, the rest of the world just isn't sure what they're gonna do. We'll see their kingdoms building up their defenses ready just in case there is another attack. Okay, that's all. Bye-bye. Back to regular Mother Goose now. So, the series starts. We find out about Korra's death. But, at this point, technology has advanced just enough to where we can see Korra's time of death and people's time of birth. And people are like, oh, well, these two twin- these two earthbending twins were born at the exact moment that Korra died. One of them's got to be the Avatar. And so they grow up with this expectation that one of them is going to be the Avatar. And they're basically treated like celebrities. But at this point, they haven't started bending the other elements. Korra, we just have to remember, is an absolute prodigy. As far as we know, she's the only Avatar who is able to build, bend three elements at such a young age. So that's not the norm. Anyway, we've got two two twins, a brother and a sister. The brother is one of the best earthbenders 
ever born. He too is a prodigy. People absolutely expect him to be the Avatar. And he does too. Even his sister believes that he's going to be the Avatar. On the other hand, she's a little more shy, a little timid, and honestly, she's not that great at earthbending. I mean, she's good, but she's definitely nothing compared to her brother. And the day comes, and this is like an event. Like, people know that one of these, yeah, one of them are going to be announced as the, uh, the next Avatar. So their 16th birthday is huge. And when the birthday comes, it is actually the sister who's named the Avatar. Now, originally I wanted them to be twin brothers, and I wanted it, the series to be called Avatar, A Tale of Two Brothers. But I really, really loved the idea of them being brother and sister, and it almost being like a reverse Azula and Zuko. Anyway, so the brother is mad, and he attempts to attack his sister. But there's a ton of people there, they stop him, but they're not able to catch him. He buries himself underground, and he escapes. Now, something I should have said a minute ago. This all takes place in Republic City. I really want it to start in Republic City so we can see where it's at now. For most of the rest of the series, Team Avatar is going to be exploring the world. Republic City is not going to be a centerpiece like it was in The Legend of Korra. Which wasn't a problem with Legend of Korra. I really liked Republic City. But we don't want to just be kind of rehashing the same story. Our current Avatar now goes on a more traditional Avatar style training. But she takes her two best friends with her. A firebender and a waterbender. The firebender is going to be her first master. They grew up together, they are best friends, and he is more than thrilled to teach her firebending. But they go to the Fire Nation to actually study. Because not only is she going to be studying with her, but she's going to be learning about Fire Nation culture and how it's progressed since the Legend of Korra and since Avatar The Last Airbender. If I remember right, we don't really see the Fire Nation a lot. Like, we see people from the Fire Nation, but they don't really visit the Fire Nation a lot in The Legend of Korra. This gives us a really good opportunity to revisit the Fire Nation. While she's in the Fire Nation, we get to see a lot of unrest. It is on the verge of its own civil war. And it doesn't start off right away. It's There is civil unrest in the Fire Nation. And throughout her time there, she gets to meet Fire Lord Iroh, who was taken over after his mother. Man, I am so excited to see Fire Lord Iroh. And he better be, he better be voiced by Dante Bosco or I'm suing. I'm suing. Here I am talking like this is an actual thing. Anyway, she masters firebending. And she also learns the ability to lightning bend. My goal by the end of the series is for this to be the most powerful avatar we've ever seen. Something else that's very important is temperature control. It's how Azula turns her fire blue. It's how Bolin is able to lava bend. It's how waterbenders are able to turn their water into ice. Temperature control is very important for benders, and that's something this series is going to explore a lot and kind of pushing the boundaries of that temperature control. And so one thing I really would love to see is this new avatar being able to have blue fire. Now don't come for my throat, okay? I know what you're saying, but that made Azula so unique. But you can't tell me that Azula was the only one able to heat their fire up enough to have blue fire. Like, I really want to see another bender be able to do this, because obviously it's possible. I think you have to be an incredibly t talented firebender, but I don't think that means only one person can do it. Like, we clearly see that multiple benders are able to metal bend. We see that multiple benders are able to lava bend. Multiple en benders are able to blood bend. I just think it would be really cool if she had blue fire, and maybe that's just like an aesthetic thing. Oh well. Feel free and at me if you want. While all this is going on, we're spending just as much time with the brother as he's going on his own Avatar journey. Yes, he may not be the Avatar, but that was his destiny, and nothing is taking that from him. He is bound and determined to go on this journey. So throughout this season, we actually get to see him traveling all over the world. Now this season's going to take place over the course of a little bit. So now that I think about it, maybe Korra should die even younger, maybe 28. 27 and that makes me really really sad but that would give this avatar enough time to master firebending in the fire nation by the end of the season i do want sozin's comet to be a season finale not a series finale but i do think it'd be great as a season finale but we'll get there in a moment anyway so while 
while this is going on, we are seeing just as much of the brother as he's traveling around the entire world, and he's learning as much about bending as possible. Not just the different subcategories of bending, but he's also studying with firebenders. He's studying with airbenders and waterbenders, and he's learning their techniques and how how they work. And even if he can't bend those elements, he's bound and determined to figure out a way to incorporate that into his bending. And he's also, just like his sister, studying the importance of temperature control. By the end of the season, remember, this season takes place over a couple of years, we get to see him figure out how to use all the subcategories of earthbending. And maybe not master all of them yet, but he's figured out how to do them. He can lava bend. He can metal bend. He can use seismic sense. And even though I personally wouldn't really consider them subcategories, but he's studying with mud and sand bending as well. He's using other bending techniques with these elements. Like, imagine him using water bending techniques, but instead of water, he's using mud. And instead of air, he's using sand. This character is bound and determined to become the best earthbender ever. And nothing's stopping him. Anyway, so like I said, by the end of the season, he hasn't mastered all of them, but he's figured out how to do them. And now we kind of get to the climax. So... I really want the Red Lotus to be the main villain of this series. I want the season one to have a little little hints here and there of the Red Lotus. And the Red Lotus are actually the ones causing all the civil unrest in the Fire Nation. And this leads to an all-out Fire Nation civil war that the Avatar must stop. And she does successfully. Her team Avatar, Fire Lord Iroh, are able to come together and save the day. But in doing so, they discover that the Red Lotus is back. That's how the season ends. There's this sense of joy, like, yes, we saved the day. We, we were victorious. But there's also this sense of dread, like, oh no, the Red Lotus is back. Like, Korra curb stomps the Red Lotus. This is true. I honestly think a couple members escaped, and after years of training and rebuilding their ranks, they have been able to rebuild their organization. Especially with how many people were angry with Korra. I mean, think about it. There are probably some non-benders who are still angry with Korra. I mean, there's still Red Lotus members. There are still Earthbenders who served Kuvira. And while I don't think it's a lot of people, there are people from Republic City who hate how much she changed everything. They went from a council to a president. They literally had their city overtaken by the spirit world, basically. Like... People do not like the Avatar. And like I said, it's not a large group. But slowly, they start to find each other. And they rebuild the Red Lotus. Anyway, that's my whole thinking behind how the Red Lotus reformed. But not only does the Avatar find out about the Red Lotus, so does her brother. Not only does he find out about them, but he joins their ranks. The series ends with him becoming a Red Lotus. Like, literally, that is the last scene. The Avatar finds out about the Red Lotus, it fades into him being initiated into the group, and it ends. It's over. That's it. That's all. That's all she wrote. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Let me know what you guys think about my pitch for season, or for book one. This would be called Fire, by the way. I really want it to go back to, to be based on what element the Avatar is learning. I should have stated that earlier. Anyway, let me know what you guys think about my pitch. I know it was kind of long. Thank you so much for watching all of that. I really hope you enjoyed it, and I will be back next week with my pitch for book two, and the week after that with book three. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Let me know what you think in the comments, and if you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like and subscribing to join the flock, and I will see you in the next one. Mother Goose out.